What's up, everybody? It's your boy Ryan, and this is the Thunder Channel on Nootropics, on testosterone, on performance. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't hit the bell to get notified of the content. If you end up liking what I'm about to say, please consider subscribing. All right, folks, so let's just get right into it. Um, ashwagandha. This is a, an Ayurvedic herb that uh, supposedly lowers stress by lowering cortisol. It's been used for centuries around the world. Uh, it's been used by biohackers for many years. I use it occasionally to sleep better. It doesn't affect me negatively. However, uh, right off the bat, there are scores, not just a few here and there. There are scores of anecdotes out there claiming that ashwagandha reduced people's libido, killed people's libido, gave them ED, in some cases gave them long-term sexual dysfunction. In some cases, uh, comparable to a very terrible condition called PSSD, which is post-SSRI uh, sexual dysfunction, where all of your sexual function is effectively muted. Now look, I don't want to gaslight people and say like, you know, because I take ashwagandha and it's largely fine for me and many of my clients that, you know, there's nothing to this because there is something to this. I've done a ton of research on it. I have a great grasp on what I think is happening, and I'm going to explain that as well as how to get out of it, so please stay tuned. But most importantly, I want to say, yes, there, there is something going on with ashwagandha and male sexual function. All right, so let's get to the details. First of all, yes, ashwagandha does heavily interact with not only a variety of hormone systems like uh, testosterone, DHEA, estradiol, but it also heavily influences the hypothalamus gonadal axis and specifically gonadotropin releasing hormone. And now there's some speculation out there that because uh, ashwagandha interacts with serotonin, which is true, that this is somehow causing sexual, sexual dysfunction and people are sort of comparing it to SSRIs, which also affect serotonin and kind of drawing this, uh, this parallel here. But I want to make that clear and I'm going to explain this later. That is a red Herring. It has nothing to do with serotonin, but it does have to do with sex hormones. And I'm going to clear all this up. In order to uh, examine these mechanisms, we have to look at the literature. So let's, uh, I'll take you to a paper titled, A Randomized Double Blind Placebo Controlled Crossover Study Examining the Hormonal and Vitality Effects of Ashwagandha, which is with Thania Somnifera. The study cites that ashwagandha was associated with an 18% greater increase in DHEAS and a 14% uh, 14.7% greater increase in testosterone. All right, check. We got that. But why does that happen? Like, what is it actually doing? The same study cites that in a recent meta-analysis comprising four clinical trials, it was concluded that ashwagandha supplementation was associated with significant increases in sperm concentration, semen volume, and sperm motility in uh, oligospermic males. Increases in serum testosterone and luteinizing hormone levels were also identified. Okay, so here's a clue. Uh, an increase in luteinizing hormone Hormone. That indicates a direct interaction with the hypothalamus and specifically the hypothalamus gonadal axis. But if you think about luteinizing hormone and where it's derived from, it ultimately comes from GnRH, which is gonadotropin releasing hormone. Okay, so here's our second major clue. Looking at the same paper, it actually states that ashwagandha has the ability to upregulate GnRH. It's upregulating gonadotropin releasing hormone, which would therefore be producing more LH and therefore producing more testosterone. Now, you would think that that is good, but potentially it's bad, and I'm going to get to that. But through this same mechanism, the literature actually elucidates that there, there's some sort of tolerance to ashwagandha as it relates to gonadotropin releasing hormone, which would eventually lead to lower output of gonadotropin releasing hormone, which would equal lower testosterone. And this paper, which is a really exhaustive paper about ashwagandha and sexual effects and hormone effects, actually does highlight a downstream example of this theory. It states, findings from the current study are consistent with previous findings as significantly higher levels of testosterone and DHEAS were identified from ashwagandha supplementation compared to placebo. It seems that the increases are not sustained over time and DHEAS and to a less to a lesser extent, testosterone was lower after eight weeks of discontinued ashwagandha supplementation. So what can we glean from that? Uh, basically, the use of ashwagandha seemed to raise testosterone, but then the ceasing of ashwagandha thereafter led to lower levels of testosterone, indicating again that s some, sort of, some sort of change took place, an adaptogenic change, some unknown mechanism has, has taken place, which is creating some sort of uh, GnRH-based dependence on ashwagandha. 
as as far as testosterone production is concerned. Now, stick with me because I'm going to get to how all this comes together. Now, one, if you look at this scientifically and objectively, one could actually couch this as a testosterone lowering effect as a result of ashwagandha withdrawal. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have tested your, you know, that have ashwagandha issues or what a sexual dysfunction from ashwagandha have tested your testosterone and it's within normal ranges and it's probably not. And there's other factors and I'm going to get to that. So please stick around. I'm not just saying it's strictly testosterone. It's actually way more nuanced than that. But th this effect on essentially what, what may end up being a down regulation of GnRH could be at play here for what's ending up producing less testosterone than you're used to, which could cause these effects. All, all, all manner of things happen when you fuss with this system. It's not just the PSSD folks and the ashwagandha folks that have uh, loss of genital sensation, etc. There's actually men on TRT that have that. Once their estradiol gets past a certain threshold, there are people that I've worked with that have had uh, uh, pituitary tumors where the prolactin was above 200. They had complete complete sexual numbness. So it's not just, you know, it's not just like SSRIs and PSSD and whatever that can cause these sort of symptoms. It's, it's, it's the downstream hormonal imbalances that can do that. Now look, okay, so moving on from that mechanism, because there's more. We, we all know that ashwagandha is known to lower cortisol. I mean, that's why a lot of people take it. And it definitely does. I take it to improve my sleep sometimes. Here's another clue. To lower cortisol, you kind of have to downregulate or slow the output of cortisol. I mean, right? Like, how, how else does this happen? Cortisol release is another hypothalamus-mediated mechanism. So as with the case of many things that cause sexual dysfunction, it actually does appear that ashwagandha, through sustained continued use, I want to make that very clear, has the ability to desensitize, downregulate, or otherwise fuss with the HPG axis. That's the hypothalamus gonadal Axis. This whole chain of things that start from GnRH and then LH and FSH, the subsequent signaling to the lytic cells, and then testosterone. You know, if, if through downregulating cortisol production, you downregulate something in the hypothalamus or the HPG axis, then yeah, that's going to lead to some sort of dysregulation in the downstream processes which they control which is testosterone production. By the way, after you get the end point of testosterone, there's a whole lot more that happens. That's really, really important for diagnosing and resolving sexual dysfunction. All right, but is that it, right? Is it, does it have nothing to do with neurotransmitters? Like what's the deal with serotonin and ashwagandha? Let's talk about it. In that long exhaustive review of ashwagandha, the same paper that I'm uh, citing here, it does cite a study which uh, shows us that ashwagandha has the ability to increase hippocampal serotonin concentrations. And if you look into the mechanism for that, so if you actually go follow the cited uh, paper, uh, it, it explains that ashwagandha does this by lowering N-NOS, which is neural nitric oxide synthase, which may s sort of stifle people's conversion of uh, free arginine to nitric oxide, which is going to lead to ED and, and otherwise libido issues. But the, the marginal increases in serotonin in this case, though may have some sort of a degree of suppressive activity on sexual function, is not the primary mechanism here. And the reason I know this is because I want to state that my experience in consulting men that have PSSD, so I'm one of the one of like three in the world consultants, like uh, biohacking s consultants that have worked with men on the ground in the trenches that have hardcore sexual dysfunction from SSRIs, again, a condition called PSSD. I have resolved the sexual function problems of many of the men that I've worked with, those that would comply with me, despite what you may have read in the web, which is I think there's like one or two threads of someone taking one guy's experience, a guy who was 100% non-compliant, wanted to drop out of one of my programs without explaining to me why, signed a contract, like, you know, took another client spot that was worth like six or $7,000. Like we don't just cancel contracts. Turns out he was an alcoholic and, and made a complete misrepresentation of what I was trying to do, which was fucking help him. Anyway. In my work with men on PSSD, I have discovered that no amount of serotonin manipulation resolves this issue. Not reducing serotonin, not marginally increasing it, not uh, markedly increasing it, not antagonizing postsynaptic serotonin 1A receptors. Serotonin in these cases is a literal red herring. Okay, so moving on, <laughs> I digress. You must always go back to, when it, when it comes to sexual dysfunction, you always have to go back to the hormones. Now, I want to make this clear because I'm sure some of you who've had PSSD or other sexual related issues from ashwagandha or whatever are going, oh, well, my testosterone is normal. Please listen up. I'm glad you said that. I want to make it clear. Whether or not you have high levels of testosterone 
does not necessarily matter in these cases when testosterone is not the only driver of sexual function. And there are many other biomarkers, if they're skewed the wrong way, that are absolute decisive inhibitors of male sexual function, ranging from libido to penile sensation to erection quality. And it's also important that you, when you look at the anecdotes of ashwagandha ruining people's libido, that you scrutinize them heavily. So me working with men, I I scrutinize everything. We're looking at actual numbers. We're not taking anecdotals. We're not like, oh, I think this did this to me and my my doc says my testosterone is normal. So let's look at, you know, one such example. Uh, In this thread of, uh, you know, user explaining how ashwagandha had muted his sexual function, he goes, I've already been to a number of doctors and they checked all my hormones, testosterone, DHT, sex hormone binding globulin, prolactin, estrogen, etc., and said everything was normal. All right, let's just stop here. This needs to be scrutinized. The doctor said, like, but, but you don't provide any readings for anybody. Doctors themselves, if they're not endocrinologists, hormone specialists, and some endocrinologists are good and some don't give a crap about their job and they're just there going through the motions. But you know, if a doctor doesn't have experience in understanding how to work people through dialing in their protocols and all the numbers for those sex hormones into adequate ranges, then their final assessment of your sex hormones are fine means nothing. So that out of the way, if you've got sexual dysfunction from ashwagandha, this is what I suggest you do. Number one, test your total testosterone, your estradiol, your estrone, and estriol. Number two, test your serum prolactin levels. Number three, if you're doing anything in your regimen, whether it's like you're omitting carbs or or there's some sort of drug or supplement that you're taking that has a suppressive effect on the hypothalamus and therefore the HPG axis, stop it immediately. Now, this is the important part. Once you get your, your readings back, your biomarker readings back on all those hormones, don't dismiss them immediately. Don't take your, your doctor's word that everything is, quote, normal. Demand to have the readings in place for them to actually give you the, the labs, the p- papers that show all your readings, and take them home so that you can analyze them. If your total testosterone is below 600 nanograms per deciliter, you need to take action. I mean, you need to take action either way, and I'm going to get to what you should do. You should, at the very least, take your total testosterone up to 900 plus nanograms per deciliter. And frankly, the best way to do this is to go on TL. TRT, which leads me to my next direct suggestion. Go on TRT. Okay, this is not a request. This is not a suggestion. Okay, I've seen this enough times. If you have muted sexual function and there is large scale dysregulation and you know what that is, you, you, you know that it's not normal, right? If you're in that category, stop everything you're doing, get with a clinic right now and get on TRT. You know, some clinics uh, require you to have suboptimal numbers. Other clinics will treat you based on symptoms and not necessarily your lab. So you want to find a, a clinic that will treat you based on symptoms. You need not to waste time fussing with serotonin and all this other bullshit, frankly. And you need to go on TRT immediately tomorrow. And we'll circle back to this in a second. Okay, so back to the labs. Analyze your estradiol. It could be anywhere on the range. It could be uber low, let's call it below 20 picograms per milliliter, in which case that's usually going to cause some sort of sexual dysfunction, or more likely it could be uber high. I and mean, this is more likely to cause sexual dysfunction if it's above the 30, 35 picograms per milliliter range. Again, there are men on full-blown TRT, and you can find this on the testosterone subreddit that have, you know, what they can only explain is complete muted sexual dysfunction, no nocturnal erections, libido issues, and a loss of sensation just because their estradiol is out of range. This is true. Generally want your estradiol to be between 18 and 30 picograms per milliliter. Next, analyze your prolactin numbers. If it is, if prolactin is even somewhat out of range, by somewhat I mean 23 uh, nanograms per milliliter. But obviously, if it's 30, 40, 50, God forbid, 100 plus, you know that that's enough. Even if it's a little bit of a range for your doctor pr- to prescribe one of two drugs: number one, cabergoline, or number two, bromocriptine both of which should lower prolactin and get it back within normal range. The difference between the two of them is really the active half-life and how aggressively they bind to the D2 receptors, which you know has a marked prolactin lowering effect. Another important part of the analysis, analyze your estrone 
and your estriol. People believe that these have no effect on sexual function, but that is absurd. If either of them are high, estriol or estriol, you need to lower them. The best way to do this is to carefully, sparingly, with the right dose, and that's usually a low dose, aromatase inhibitor like anastrozole. All right now, circling back, and I'll, I'll get I'll get to some more details on anastrozole here in a second on controlling estrogen, but circling back to TRT. Being able to inject testosterone on your own schedule gives you direct control over all of these processes. You know, most uh, TRT clinics are going to prescribe you anastrozole just as a fail-safe, you know, which is an estrogen-lowering compound. It prevents uh, some of your T from being converted into estrogen, and they'll do that whether or not you have high or low levels of estrogen. They're just going to want to have you have it around and that is a good idea for this particular situation. Monitor your labs, okay? Get your total testosterone in the 900 to 1,000 nanograms per deciliter range. If you need to control estradiol, and again, if that's above 30 picograms per milliliter, low dose anastrozole, I can't give you an exact protocol, but you'd probably be looking at 0.25 or 0.5 milligrams once weekly, not twice weekly, not three times weekly, once weekly. That stuff is very powerful and you don't want to crash your estrogen. You want to get your estrogen again in the 18 to 30 picograms per milliliter range. And again, if prolactin is high, even a little bit above the reference range, do all of the things that I suggested and get a script for either cabergoline or bromocryptine, start dosing it to get your prolactin back in range. Those are my suggestions on how to resolve your uh, ashwagandha induced sexual dysfunction. And really the same thing would apply to PSSD, except for maybe a little more nuanced on some of this stuff. W with all those things in place, so say you get all these hormone numbers in the right place and you, you, you stay there. Even with that, it may take time with that exact protocol to recover. And that could be three months, it could be six months, it could be slightly more. And that is because there are a ton of unknown potentials related to the starving of androgen receptors specifically of, of androgens and the downstream effects that they may have, that may have on the individual tissues which androgens communicate and bind directly to. Like the penis has androgen receptors. The brain has androgen receptors. So if those receptors have been starved from androgens for a considerable period of time, you may need to have the perfect protocol but for six months straight to get resolution of these issues. Meaning you may need to have sustained levels. Not It's like not going to you know, resolve like a broken arm doesn't fix in a day. It's got to sit in a cast for how long? Four weeks, six weeks, two months, uh, I, you know, however long it takes. So you may need time f with sustained levels of the right hormones and the right levels to get your morning wood back, nocturnal wood back, um, random erections back, sensation back, libido back, even climax ability back. It may take some time. Remember the mechanisms that we discussed to upregulate the neural nitric oxide synthase production. You know, you could take compounds like icarin, uh, L-citrulline or, or arginine in the meantime to sort of supplement the blood flow issue in, you know, in the meantime. And lastly, okay, last sort of suggestion or caveat, in some cases of extreme sexual dysfunction, Men do best on both exogenous testosterone and something like HCG or Clomid. Now, these are essentially exogenous compounds that either mimic LH, which make you endogenously, your testicles produce testosterone and sperm, or, you know, in the case of Clomid, they actually facilitate GnRH production and uh, that whole downstream process from the hypothalamus level. You may need Clomid plus TRT, or you may need HCG plus TRT. Circling back to PSSD, again, a paralleling, uh, you know, sort of dysfunction. My experience in the men that I've helped resolve PSSD and the only documented actual sustained recoveries from, again, this paralleling sexual dysfunction syndrome called PSSD is with exogenous testosterone in some cases by itself, but in most cases, exogenous T, injectable testosterone, with gonadotropin replacement, so with either HCG or Clomid. If you want proof of this, you need to thoroughly study and scrutinize this thread on the PSSD forum. It's titled 21 PSSD Success Stories with Steroids plus 11 PFS and PAS Cures. Those are un other paralleling syndromes that are induced by uh, hair growth drugs that uh, fuss with 5-alpha reductase and DHT like finasteride. But you're not going to see people saying that they depleted their serotonin levels and they got better from any of these conditions. In fact, you'll, you'll always see that they had side effects and it didn't resolve the condition, right? So if all else fails and you've given testosterone and balancing estradiol 
estriol, estrone, and prolactin, and when you got them in the tight ranges that you need them in, and you've given that three to six months of that sustained protocol, and you're still not better, continue with the TRT and bring in either HCG or Clomid. Hope that's been useful. Uh, if you need to go and like save this video, please bookmark it. Like it if it made sense to you or if anything that I said spoke to you, please like the video, subscribe to this channel and share it because there's a lot of people out there that are misled, uh, confused, or just have no idea which directions to go in. There's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of people purporting serotonin is at the root of this, which it's not. And get this to as many people as possible. If that means going in all of the threads that on Reddit where people are posting about ashwagandha, post this video. If you have something to say, please comment in the comment section. I'll do my best to respond to you. If you need my help personally on this stuff, you can hire me in under a minute at livecortex.com. I do coaching and consulting on this stuff. I've had many clients with all ranges of sexual dysfunction, ranging from, of course, PSSD to pituitary tumors to all manner of dysregulation of these hormonal cascades. And I have a pretty good record of getting people back to normal, but that can only happen when you understand all this. You get super nuanced about it. You don't take your doctor's word for everything is normal. And you take a really deep dive into managing these hormones and getting them into normal ranges for sustained periods of time. I hope this has been useful for people. This is something that means a lot to me. You know, I've had a lot of experience dealing with this and Frankly, I've seen a lot of uh, men in pain, painful positions because of this, you know, so I want this to get out to as many people as possible. All right, everyone, hope you have a great day, and I'll talk to you on the next one.